This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Mark Weissey. He's a multifamily owner-operator with a deep background in financial analysis, modeling, and technology systems. He's been investing since 2017 and today controls over $10 million in commercial real estate. In addition, he recently founded a mastermind of active operators across, across the country to help its members share knowledge, leverage best practices, grow their, and grow their businesses together. Uh, you know, he is, he's hustling, right? He's making it happen. He's, he's made it happen. He's doing it. Uh, but while still working full time, you know, he, he was working full time and decided to, it wasn't as secure maybe as what everybody thought, right? Or thinks. Uh, and I was in that same boat, uh, but Mark, uh, he's doing it, right? Doing both of these things at the same time. He's going to share some of those specific systems uh, and software and, and really just habits uh, that, that have helped him to make this happen. Uh, and I just think if you implemented just a few of these things, you're going to go further faster. A lot of people think that real estate is going to be a get rich quick thing. You know, they get in and things happen that are unexpected and sometimes uh, is, is not very fun. And sometimes we call it a seminar. Our guest today is going to share about some of those seminars, uh, but he has done it. He's made it happen. Uh, while so many think, uh, man, I'm still working full time or I'm doing other things. I can't, I don't have the time. He's done just that. Uh, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Whitney. As I said before, you know, I'm a longtime listener. It's really an honor to be here. Yeah, honored to have you, Mark. I look forward to diving into your your story and helping the listeners to be able to do the same uh, and learn from you and your your seminars uh, that you've received. Uh, and so, hopefully, we don't learn we don't we don't have to have some of those same hard seminars, right? Uh, and so, Mark, who who is Mark? Let's dive in. How did you get into multifamily syndication? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version, but uh, I am uh, I come from a second generation immigrant family. My father came to this country in the 80s in the Middle East, uh, chasing the American dream like a lot of immigrants do. And so I grew up uh, pretty solidly middle class with a, a focus on, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and things like that. Um, however, as most people who are the children of immigrants can probably attest to, uh, the first thing that my parents wanted me to do was to get a you know secure job at a, a large corporation. And so uh, I did that. I went to school, started working on Wall Street, and have been working in my W-2, as, as you alluded to uh, there in the intro, ever since. And so on the side of my job, I've been, for the last six or so years, kind of focused on building up my, my real estate portfolio. Nice. So you did go get that quote secure job, right? And, and uh, but you decided, hey, maybe there's something else out there I should I should be doing, or like what? Why? Why add that stress to your life, Mark? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my original intention was to be able to build uh, something on the side that could help me weather the storm because I, I mentioned secure job, but realistically, anybody with a W-2 knows that there's nothing secure about it. And, you know, your number could be picked uh, on any given day or any given week, and you have to have a contingency in place. And so I started working in 2011 on Wall Street, as I mentioned, and it was really an interesting time to start working in that particular industry because, you know, we had just come out of the financial crisis. A lot of people's, you know, heads were down. They were just focused on making it to the next week and weren't sure when the next shoe would drop, so to speak. And so I saw a lot of my colleagues, a lot of people that I worked with who had essentially, you know, worked their entire careers, 30 and 40 years uh, sometimes uh, in the same industry and were still kind of at risk and, and worried about losing their job. And so I didn't want that to be the case uh, as I move forward and, you know, built a family and things like that. I wanted to build up some kind of a buffer um, and, and you know, ultimately reach the point where I'm financially independent. Well, that is scary to think, you know, I have committed my working career to this employer for 20 to 30 years, but I may be let go soon. I mean, that, phew, that's terrifying, right? And, and you're not very marketable, unfortunately, at that point, you know, often, right, as an employee, um, but uh, but it's maybe it, sometimes it takes that long to figure out it's not as secure maybe as you thought it was, you know, uh, or things happen, right? They're balled out or all of a sudden you got a new boss and you don't have that relationship anymore that you've built for 20 years. You know, the decision maker is not the same person. So um, I just think it's a, a point, you know, that needs to be made often. So those that are listening that are in those shoes that can plan like you've done. 
All right. So you wanted you wanted to find something outside of that, right? Uh, to uh, to really guard yourself against that potential risk. What did you do? Why real estate and and why you know multifamily or my syndication? Yeah, absolutely. So I started off in residential real estate. Um, I had bought a condo. I live here in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, just across the river from Manhattan, uh, where prices are are anything but uh, affordable. And so I figured, okay, a condo was the lowest barrier to entry uh, investment that I can get into. Um, and now what led me to real estate was up until then, I had been exposed pretty heavily to public markets. You know, I was working on a trading floor uh, where a lot of bonds, stocks, all of these um, quote unquote traditional asset classes were being traded. And that was great. And I got a, you know, firsthand view into the, you know, risk and reward that those can offer. Um, but I, I had always kind of had in the back of my mind this idea of ownership of tangible assets. And so um, I think another thing that was influenced by my immigrant background was um, I think a lot of people come to this country, one of the first things that they try to do is to buy their own home. And so, you know, whether consciously or subconsciously, I had always had in the back of my head, hey, I need to own real estate. And so I bought a condo and, uh, you know, got a, uh, I would say, a, a landlording light uh, seminar in that the, uh, I was, you know, house hacking before I even knew the terminology. And, uh, you know, from there, it, it kind of spiraled into me buying another condo and then single family and kind of working my way up to, you know, smaller multifamily. Nice, nice. How did you? Um, I mean, how did you learn how to do syndication? I mean, what what did that look like? How did you break into that space? It can seem so overwhelming to to most, right? Uh, what were some of the first steps? And then let's dive into you know where you're at now and the, some of the systems that you created because it is not. E I did the same thing. It is not easy to be working full time while trying to you know run another business. Yeah, absolutely. So in residential real estate, one thing that uh, a lot of uh, people talk about is that, you know, you can have really great months and then you have one expense or you have one vacancy and it can wipe out, you know, an entire year's cash flow. So that was something that really didn't align with what I was trying to achieve. Again, I wanted that that security blanket, that that consistency of cash flow to support me. And so I saw that, you know, I wasn't going to be able to scale my portfolio in a way to be able to achieve that for many, many years. And so I wanted to figure out a better way to kind of uh, get myself where I wanted to be. And I, I landed on multifamily after having gone to a number of different meetups in my local market. I had gone to a bunch of flipper and funder events, and those were great. Um, but, you know, I knew that I didn't want another job. And then I, I went to, you know, a few smaller multifamily. And then finally, I landed on a meetup that was more catered towards multifamily syndication. And I was sure enough at my first meetup at that event, and I was sitting next to a guy who had hundreds of units under his belt, and he wasn't that much older than me. And I figured, okay, well, if this guy could do it, you know, why why can't I do it? You know, it's not. You as thought you thought you had to be a problem. really old man to be able to do this do this thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or a large company. You know, I just wasn't exposed to this world. And seeing him do that, and then seeing others meeting others at that event that were achieving such you know large portfolios and taking down such large assets, it made it real to me that I could do this. And from there, it kind of kicked off a, a series of of learning, and mentorships, and and coaching, and things like that. Yeah, I have a similar story, but really just the mental block, you know, thinking, well, there's no way I could do that, right? Uh, and, but then meeting numerous people who had done it, who were probably younger than I was, and only been in the business a year or so, and were doing, you know, buying 100 unit buildings. And I was just like, wait a minute, you know, uh, if they can do it, I can, I can do it too. I'll figure this out, right? Uh, one way or the other. But okay, let's dive in there. You know, you, you, you got some mentorship or you started educating yourself, but how did you, you know, what were some of the first steps to build your business, some of the systems you had in place? Cause it is not easy. Like I said, to be working full time while still doing this, right. Or trying to get a business started. It's very difficult. Uh, and, and most won't keep it going. Right. Uh, and so how did you do that? What were, how did you streamline some of that stuff or what were, what was important to you then uh, to get the business going while working full time? Yeah. Um, so I think the key for anybody that's approaching this business with a W-2 job is just to be realistic with your expectations. Um, I think you really have to be someone that strives for continuous improvement, you know, incremental improvement. You're not going to build a business that's, you know, doing, you know, hundreds of millions in acquisitions overnight. And so I think it's really important that you really be very intentional about what you're trying to do on a given day. 
Uh, so some of the things that I did were the coaching that I mentioned. Um, at, that kind of led me to other individuals that were doing it, maybe a few steps ahead of me. Um, at that point, I tried to, myself and my partner at this point, I had met a partner and we were looking to do this together. So we tried to approach those individuals that were you know, of value to us and provide value to them. Uh, and so we did that without ever you know, asking anything in return, just trying to learn. And sure enough, uh, one of the mentors that we had at the time invited us to help him out on a capital raise on a deal that he was doing. And so that gave us a lot of you know, a, an introduction into really how you do these deals. And so once we had done that deal with him, we really gained the confidence to say, okay, this is how soup to nuts, how you do these deals. And let's go out and, and start to look for our own opportunities. Yeah. Awesome. So you found, yeah, you met others. You started, what, what was the, what was the value that you added? Cause I get that question a lot. A lot of times people say, well, you know, find other people in the space to tell you add value to them. Uh, and I feel like it's a big roadblock for some because they're like, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know what I can do to help them. You know, what did that look like for you? Uh, you know, how did you add value to somebody like that? That's say, you know, ahead of you all at the time. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the things that we contributed were marketing. They were uh, in the midst of looking at a deal uh, that they were pretty sure were, they were going to move forward on. So we helped them underwrite as well as market that deal to potential LPs. Uh, so we came up with kind of all of the copy that they would use as well as uh, scheduled a webinar for them to present that deal. And so we did a lot of the more administrative work, the stuff that probably not a lot of us really enjoy. Um, but we we were able to kind of fill that need and get them in front of, I think, on our first webinar with just our LPs, we had 30 or 35 uh, interested individuals, which was, we thought, a pretty good accomplishment at the time, given that we had never raised capital before. And so we we got them in front of those folks, helped them raise some capital, helped them serve in, in you know, during the acquisitions in an investor relations uh, capacity and uh, ultimately get that deal across the finish line. Awesome. Yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, and oftentimes I find there is like a, a marketing component that people in our space need. Like I need lots of help with marketing. <laughs> I mean, myself, you know, and I just, I know so many who, even guys that are way ahead of us uh, that have been doing this 20 years, oftentimes they're really good at real estate, but man, their marketing stinks, you know? Uh, I mean, it does, right? They're they're not savvy on the computer. They're not savvy uh, with marketing, all that stuff. And they don't need to be, right? They're really good at this thing over here that they need to be good at. Uh, but then oftentimes somebody that's younger, right? I mean, uh, you know, not always, but normally they're more savvy, you know, with technology and, and can help in a big way and understand social media so much better, uh, and much less, you know, being able to help with the deal and creating, you know, the the brochures, things like that, you know, you're just going to be more savvy. Uh, um, and believe it or not, you know, and, and individually, you think you're not probably right, but you probably are, you know, uh, but you know, like you, you got to reach out, you got to find that individual you can add that value to and start having those conversations. That's incredible. Um, now let's jump to, you know, you, you mentioned in some other information, you know, like these painful seminars or hard lessons, right? Um, you know, let's chat about, uh, you know, a couple of those or or maybe an example that you could help the listeners with as, as so they don't experience the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the other things that we were doing at, around that same time, this was around 2018 or so, we were just dabbling our feet into multifamily. Okay, what is it? How does it work? How do you add value as an operator? And so, as I mentioned, we we're going to meetups, we we're meeting a ton of people, and we we're also looking to contribute our own capital as LPs and deals. I think that that's something that a lot of people talk about as a good way to kind of get your feet wet and learn the business is by being an LP in a deal. It'll help a lot of operators kind of give you the time of day because after all, you're their client in a way. So you'll be able to maybe get them to peel back the onion a little bit more than if you were just an outsider that really wasn't involved with the deal otherwise. And so we started investing with a group uh, initially they were based in a market very close to us. This was in Philadelphia. And, you know, we thought we were kind of on our way and we were, uh, you know, invested in this deal. Everything was going to go well. And then about a year into that process, we figured out that, hey, you know, maybe something was awry here and maybe we trusted the wrong jockey, so to speak, in this deal. Wow. Trusted the wrong jockey. What happened? Like, give us some more details there. Maybe how that changed what you're doing moving forward. 
Yeah, so the first kind of yellow flag, if you want to call it that, was the lack of communication. I think that that's so key and something that we took away from this. It was very much a, another seminar in that it, these were all the things that we learned not to do when we were doing deals. So, for example, the level of communication that we received was very inconsistent. Uh, there were a lot of details left out. And so a year into it, we just flat out were not receiving updates on what was going on with the asset. And so it took us actually going down there to the market, to the actual property to figure out that, hey, you know, this business plan that we had put our hard earned money behind, it's not getting executed upon, at least to the degree that we thought it should. And so, you know, that kicked off a, a number of different things where we were asking them a bunch of questions and we ultimately had to roll up our sleeves and get involved in a deal, believe it or not. We went from being LPs to very much being active members of the of the deal. Yeah. Wow. So you, uh, like you said, you had to roll your sleeves up. What, what actually then happened uh, as far as, you know, you had to get more involved. You had to uh, learn a lot very quickly, sounds like. Uh, but well, what happened then? What did you have to do? How did it turn out? Yeah, absolutely. So this was all going on, you know, by the time that we figured this out and then uh, the time that we figured that there was going to be no uh, knight in shining armor coming to our rescue, that we were going to have to roll up our sleeves. This was happening around COVID. So it was a particularly inter interesting time. And so we basically took over running the deal. We were there in the market probably two to three times a week. Uh, I, at times, was sleeping at the property, believe it or not. So really just making a lot of sacrifices to make sure that this uh, investment was protected and that this business plan was executed upon. So, you know, I was there multiple times a week uh, dealing with contractors, um, you know, getting our property management up and running. And it was basically like starting a deal from scratch but, you know, with less than the ideal amount of budget that you'd like to. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I, well, you know, just thinking about some of those things, though, uh, if it doesn't crush you, uh, it's like such good lessons, right? Uh, I mean, it's such good lessons moving forward. Uh, and, you know, moving forward, you're probably going to maybe analyze deals a little differently or operators, you know, right, a little differently. Uh, you know, what are some things you're asking about now, though, that maybe you didn't ask about that one? Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing that I always try to keep in mind when I'm evaluating, because I still invest in other folks' deals as an LP, one of the first things I look at is track record. So how have they operated in the past? I'll look for them to provide me, you know, a series of reports, budget versus actuals. I think that's a really good one to ask for. You know, how did they perform versus what they kind of said they would do uh, to investors? And so I, I look for that. I also look to see if I can get some kind of a reference or referral from previous investors that have gone full cycle with them. You know, it's it's really important to find operators that you can trust and have gone full cycle because that's kind of, you know, proof of concept. Uh, as far as how they operate with your investment. Um, and then also, I, I try to ask them, you know, what are the bumps and bruises that they've learned along the way? Anybody that's not going to tell you that they've, you know, they're going to tell you that they've never failed or never had a seminar, so to speak, you know, that's not somebody that I want to invest with. I, I think it's, it's a very uh, easy way to cut through all the BS to learn what somebody uh, is or who, you know, how they operate by asking them, hey, tell me about some of your war stories of deals that you've encountered and how you reacted to that. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate that we learn the most during hard times. <laughs> you know, it's not fun, but it is true, right? You know, we do typically learn the most. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, one of the guests just recently said something like smooth sales don't make great sailors. You know, so there's some you know, some kind of saying like that that I really liked. Uh, I, you know what? I know who it was. It was uh, Joe Burko. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But anyway, he's the one that said that. I just thought that's, that's true, right? And, and you talking about investing as an LP or even partnering with somebody, that's a good question, right, to dive in on and figure out, hey, what's some hard lessons that they have had? And if they say, well, you know, everything's been great, well... Uh, <laughs> You know, yeah, maybe, you know, it's, you need to go somewhere else. Uh, but speak to, uh, I wanted to dive in a little bit, though, too, on some of the systems that you put in place as far as while working full time, still operating a business like this, still working with investors, you know, wh what did you use to, I don't know, was there any kind of automations or software or uh, team or I, I don't know, just anything around that that you could help the listener with also? 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I was keenly aware of as we were getting into this business was the fact that with a W-2 job, especially in finance, you know, time was going to be something that I have a limited amount of. And so I wanted to be most effective with the ter- time that I had to be able to, you know, make the steps in my business that I needed to. So systems was one of the first things that we looked at. Things like a CRM. I mean, there are tons of free CRMs out there that are perfectly adequate. We use today HubSpot, which we think has a really good set of features for our investors and to be able to keep tabs of our relationships. I think the CRM is one that you really want to learn about and invest time in when you're starting out, because after all, this is a relationship business. And to be able to adequately pour into and invest in those relationships that you think matter, I think a CRM is going to be paramount. Um, and so that was that was one of them. We also, as we were taking over assets and you know building up our, our acquisition pipeline, we needed a way to kind of manage the different projects that were going on at a given time, uh, as well as the acquisition kind of pipeline that we had built up. And so for that, we leaned on Asana. That's another great one that's you know out of the box, works really well for multifamily syndications, uh, and is also free when you start out. You know, depending on what you need. Um, and so those two systems, I think. By and large, we're we're responsible for a lot of what we've achieved to date. Um, besides that, I use you know the Google Calendar to time block. I think time blocking is really important. Uh, chunking up like activities throughout the day, I think, is really important. You know, this is a business where there are a ton of different things to do at any given moment, and a ton of different distractions that if you're if you're not very protective over your time can take you. Uh, astray to the point where, you know, I had when I was starting out days where I felt like I was being very productive, but then I look back at the day and it's like, I wasn't able to get done what I, I set out to, you know, wanting to do. And so time blocking was really effective. And that was something that I stole from, uh, I believe, four hour work week uh, to be able to, uh, you know, set aside the, that time to really focus on some of the deeper things I needed to do. Um, so those are three of the systems I think have been really pivotal. And then the last system, which I, I think of as a system more so than technology, is being very intentional about my week. So I start off my week with a game plan of these are the things that I want to do. These are my top priorities. And then really scheduling those into my calendar that no matter what gets done throughout the week or what comes at me, I know that I want to get these th- things done. And then you know assessing how I was on the prior week. That's some great suggestions. I mean, right there, you know, CRM, yes, everybody needs a CRM. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. We used HubSpot for a number of years. We don't nail them, but, but it's a great platform uh, to grow into and and uh, almost wish we were still on it, honestly. Um, but uh, project management, we also use Asana. Time blocking, uh, great suggestion. Uh, and if, uh, you know, listeners not doing that, they should be, right? Uh, and my calendar is, I could not make it without my calendar, I don't think, you know, like, uh, you know, I have to look at it constantly to figure out what I'm doing, you know, the next day or, uh, but, you know, but there's rules that I put in place about my calendar, right? My assistant knows, you know, different times of day or different days of the week, I'm doing specific things. But I liked how you said, you know, chunking up like activities. I don't, I don't know that I've heard that before, uh, but I think it makes a ton of sense, right? You know, and you're just less distracted doing random things. You can spend more time doing that thing right uh in diving in there's a book uh recently read called deep work uh and i you know i, I wish I, I highly recommend but uh but it's it's similar to that right it, it, you know it's being able to spend l- larger periods of time doing this whatever that thing is right uh but with without distraction uh but the value of not being distracted even just a little bit right you know of, of getting that slack message or that text message or going back to email for a few minutes, you know, it just derails your thought process, you know, too often, me for sure. Um, and so I have to be, you know, so intentional about that. But but I, I like the being intentional about your week and scheduling most, you know, the most important things in uh, and then assessing how it was. Um, I think it's such good advice. Uh, do you include anybody else in on that? Like uh, your spouse or uh, a partner, you know, your, your business partner, anybody, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. So we have an accountability uh, group, kind of a mastermind, I guess you could call it these days, uh, where it's other multifamily folks who are all looking to grow our businesses at various levels of their their journey. And we actually share a lot of these accountability points each week 
And then on Sundays, we will meet and go through what we were able to get done, what we weren't able to get done, as well as, you know, course correcting. What got in the way? How can we approach this differently to be more effective at what we're doing? Awesome. Yeah, I love the accountability. All right, we got to have it. All right, you got to have some accountability. Mark, we're going to jump to a few final questions. Uh, but what's your best source for meeting new investors right now? Yeah, I think one that I really enjoy is face to face. So I attend a lot of meetups. I have been fortunate to be now asked to be presenting at meetups. So that was something that uh, I, I really always kind of looked forward to. I was I was an attendee to these meetups. So it's been really great to be able to provide my time and some of the lessons I've learned at those meetups. And as a function of that, you know, people get to know me and and I keep in touch with folks. And so I think that's a really effective way to to use your time as being, you know, face to face with someone. Well, it's not maybe the uh you know, birdshot approach in terms of being able to cover a lot of ground, you know, uh, I think those relationships are a lot more meaningful than somebody that might have just come across my social media profile or, or whatever have you. Yeah, so one of the things we've been working on really is tracking a lot more of what we do to be more effective. And so some of the KPIs that we look at, I'll, I'll kind of focus on asset management, things like uh, NOI at the properties over time. How are we performing? Um, I think that's one of the most you know important metrics. Um, also, uh, from a acquisition standpoint, we'll look at things like how many broker touches are we having per week? How many deals are we underwriting per week? How many offers are we making? Um, you know, just breaking down the KPIs that you think are, are leading indicators. I think it's really easy to, at the beginning of the year or whenever you schedule your, your goal setting, to be able to say, okay, over the next course of the next year, I want to get two deals, you know, over 100 units and, and so on. And that's great to have that in mind. But it, goals are only great in a sense that they propel us to take some actions. And so we really like to track a lot more of the leading indicators that will get us there. Um, as opposed to just number of deals or number of investors that have invested in our deal. Um, and so some of those KPIs were the ones I mentioned, um, as well as I think uh, a lot more recently, we're, we're tracking how our, our portfolio is, is performing on the asset management side. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I appreciate you elaborating on the, some different things. Uh, but what about uh, habits that you are disciplined about that have produced the highest return for you? Yeah, I think a lot of this uh, comes down to what I said earlier with that uh, process where I look at my week, one week forward, and I'll say, okay, what do I, what must, must I absolutely get done in order to track to my 90 day goals, my one year goals, and so on. And so I think being very intentional about every Sunday, I'm going to sit down and and you know, go through my following week and what what I think would make a successful week, and then the following Sunday look at okay, what was I able to get done? Uh, it's kind of back to that old thing of you know, um, you know, sharpening the axe as opposed to spending all your time cutting. Uh, and so I, I found that that's made a ton of difference. I also think, frankly, that looking back on your previous week and celebrating those small wins, uh, I think you know, in order to be successful, you have to be in the emotion of success. And being solace in those small victories has also been really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. We often forget to do that, right? Celebrate the small victories. We get so caught up in what's next. I'm very guilty of that. Uh, but uh, how do you like to give back? Yeah, I think first and foremost, I like to give my time. So I mentioned it at, at meetups and really whenever anybody will contact me about, you know, they're looking to get started and looking to maybe pick up some of the lessons that I've learned without having to go through those painful experiences. I'll absolutely go out of my way to, you know, give them the information that I've learned uh, the hard way, in a sense. Um, so that's one thing. Um, also, one of the ways I like to give back in my community is I uh, also help mentor uh, a child. So I've been mentoring for the last five or six years, and I find that that's been really a rewarding and, and probably, uh, you know, I've gotten more out of it than I think the kid has, frankly. Um, but I always try to, you know, make an impact, however small, in my community. That's awesome. Appreciate you doing the mentoring. It's, uh, we need more people that are willing to mentor younger folks, right? Or kids and uh, appreciate you doing that. So Mark, grateful to meet you and have you on the show. Uh, you know, you have, you've been down a path that many are, are looking towards uh, going down themselves, right? You know, starting a business and it, while working full time, trying to still support the family, right? While while getting something else started that uh, that maybe will provide some of that so-called security, you know, that we all thought that W-2 or a lot of us thought anyway, you know, was going to provide for us. 
Uh, but uh, so just appreciate you being real with us, right? And, and being very transparent, uh, you know, about some of those uh, seminars that, that you know, you had uh, hard lessons, you know, but then some of those steps too, like CRE on the project manager, the time blocking, some of those things that you put in place that have helped you to move quickly. Uh, what I say, you know, quickly compared to most, I think, you know, as, as far as growing a business, but how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you can reach out to me at Mark, that's M-A-R-C, at investwithmaple.com. Also, feel free to check out our website, www.investwithmaple.com. Or you can find me on any of the social platforms. Uh, it's just Mark, first name, M-A-R-C, last name, Y-C, W-E-I-S-I. -I. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Feel free to get a hold of me. And like I said, I'm here to provide value, here to serve you know, the community. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.